being 2 p.m. We will move to question time. I will call Senator Hughes. The question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Yesterday in question time you stated, what is it that the Prime Minister Albanese hasn't done to help the Australian people? Minister, can you confirm that the Prime Minister has not decreased power prices for Australian families by $275, despite promising 97 times before the election that he would do so? Thank you, Senator Hughes. Minister Farrell. He's across everything, this bloke. Senators, I've just called the minister to his feet. Thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, Senator uh, Hughes for uh, her, uh, her question and uh, the opportunity to talk again about um, what a terrific job our Prime Minister is doing uh, when he's uh, not uh, progressing the issue of uh, uh, recognition of uh, an Indigenous invoice to, uh, to this parliament. Of course, he's dealing with all of the issues which, regrettably, um, the former uh, government, your government, a government that you were part of, uh, uh, Senator Hughes, simply failed um, to do. Um, and so, um, bit by bit, we're trying to um, <coughs> restore the Australian economy, deal with all of those serious cost of living pressures that every single family is facing right at the moment because of your neglect of things like an energy policy, things like dealing with the issue of, uh, of climate change. Um, each day, the Prime Minister wakes up and thinks, how can I help Australian families to reduce, reduce and push down, push down, push down, push down, push, push down, push down, push down the cost of living for hard-working Australian, uh, Australian families. Um, that's what this Prime Minister is focused on, not picking up, not picking up sort of other, um, other uh, ministries from uh, other members of uh, his, uh, his Cabinet, uh, but dealing with the serious issues that are facing Australian people as a result of those nine or ten years of neglect under your former, uh, former government. Uh, Senator Hughes for a supplementary. Oh. Uh, Minister, you said yesterday the Prime Minister has done so much to reduce the cost of living. Can you please name a single cost to Australian families that is lower now than when the Albanese government was elected? Uh, Minister Farrell. What's gone down, Don? So, thank, uh, thank you. Uh, Order. Order. Order, Minister Farrell. Um, Minister, please continue. Thank you, President, and uh, I thank uh, Senator Hughes for her uh, supplementary uh, uh, supplementary questions. Um, well, um, what did we do when we first came to um, uh, to uh, uh, to government? Um, we supported. Um, uh, a, uh, um, a rise uh, in the minimum wage for ordinary Australian workers. What was, what was your policy at the time? Your policy as... Um, Minister Farrell, uh, please resume your seat. Senator Hughes. Point of order, uh, Madam President, relevance, and in a bid to ensure we don't get another 30 seconds of ums and ahs, the question was very specific as to naming a single cost for Australian families, that has come down a single cost. Thank you, uh, uh, Senator, and I appreciate Senator you Hughes. redirecting the minister Thank to you, the question. Senator Hughes, um, the minister did start off with a bit of a preamble, but uh, as you got to your feet, he had started to name some costs. You mightn't agree with them, but he was being relevant to your, quest to your question, Minister Farrell. Thank you, Thank you, President, and uh, of course, Senator Hughes wouldn't agree with what I'm about to say, but. Let's go through some of the things that uh, have been the subject of downward pressure as a result of uh, the work done by the Prime Minister and the rest, and the rest of these wonderful people. Uh, so we've cut the price of the PBS medicines from $42.50 uh, 
down to thirty dollars. No, you don't like me talking about. You don't like me talking about the things that have gone down because we've been doing some. The time for answering has um, expired, and senators, I was trying to draw uh, the minister to sit down, but there was so much noise in this chamber he was unable to hear me. He is answering questions asked by opposition senators, and uh, I'm certainly entitled to hear the answer, as are other senators. Um, Senator Hughes, second supplementary. President. Does the Prime Minister follow your rule, Minister, and not closely follow power prices or grocery prices? Is this why the Prime Minister Albanese thinks Australians have a pretty good 10 months despite their electricity bills, grocery bills, mortgage repayments and rent all going up? Does this show how, to, how out of touch your government is? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Senator Hughes. Minister Farrell. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Hughes for her uh, second, uh, second, uh, um, uh, second uh, question. <coughs> um, uh, look, I have to say I was a bit disappointed in the way in which um, the uh, <coughs> leader, in particular, uh, put up uh, items on his uh, his uh, Facebook uh, page uh, yesterday. A bit, um, seeking to seeking to se seeking to seeking to uh, misrepresent uh, my uh, views by cutting. Uh, uh, Minister uh, Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator uh, Hughes. Point of point of order relevance here. This is a very serious question affecting everyday Australians and their rising prices that they're facing everywhere. Uh, uh, and you, I would Senator appreciate Hughes. the minister being relevant Thank to the question. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Um, I'm glad that you order, Senator. I'm glad you pointed out it's a serious question. I would hope all questions are serious, and I would ask senators to remain silent so that we can all hear the answers. I will direct um, the minister to your question, Minister. Thank you, uh, um, President. And as I was saying, um, my staff recommended that I perhaps request that this uh, Facebook page be uh, taken down because it is in fact in breach of the rules. But when we discovered that only there were only 71 likes to this particular <laughs> Facebook page. Um, we decided not to. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Order. Order. Um, Senator Hughes. Madam President, this question was not with regards to Senator Farrell or Senator Birmingham's uh, social you. media. Senator Hughes, uh, I would you will... ask that the minister, in his last eight seconds, address mm -hmm. at least part of the question. Senator Hughes, um, when raising a point of order, please come directly to the point. You will note your last point of order. I directed the minister to your question, and I'll direct him again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, uh, um, President. Um, look, there, there is no person in this country who is more concerned about cost of living. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Farrell. Order. Order. Senator Payman. My question is to the Minister for Finance and the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister please tell us how the government is assisting Australian households to deal with cost of living pressures? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. Um, and I thank Senator Payman for her question. And I can um, provide an update to the uh, chamber on how the government is working hard and is focused on how we can make life easier for each and every Australian. We are certainly aware of uh, Australians who are facing tough times with some of the increases in the cost of living. And um, these, of course, some of them in relation to power have been caused by the ongoing war in Ukraine, which has driven up gas prices. There's continued disruption on our supply chains following years of chaos and uh, impacted, of course, by the pandemic. And that there are the successive interest rate rises that we've seen as the Reserve Bank, uh, which started on its tightening um, uh, arrangements uh, before the last election. But there are other factors that we can address where we are, where we, and where we can, we are. One of the very first acts of the Albanese government was to successfully argue for a minimum wage to keep pace with inflation, an outcome which helped around 2.7 million Australians and was a real change in approach uh, between us and the former government on wages. 
Our first budget focused on responsible cost of living relief that didn't put extra pressure on inflation. Uh, that's one of the most important things in terms of our investments. So they were things like cheaper childcare, expanding paid parental leave, cheaper medicines, more affordable housing, and getting wages moving again. In addition, as, we, as winter approaches, we're providing and will provide through the budget energy relief to millions of households, uh, payments that those opposite opposed. Uh, these households will pay up to a third less than the re retail price when their energy bills come in. And again, it beggars belief that those opposite decided to oppose um, the laws that put in place those arrangements. And uh, of course, and I'll go to this more in the next uh, questions, uh, our investments Thank in you, early Minister. education the time and care. For answering has expired. Senator Payman, first supplementary. In 100. Order. Order. I have a senator on her feet, Senator Payman. In 100 days, cheaper childcare will be a reality for millions of Australian families. How will the government's investment in early childhood education and care assist with cost of living pressures, Minister? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, Senator Payman, for being on the same page uh, in relation to early education and care. In 100 days, cheaper uh, early childhood education and care will provide cost of living relief for around 1.2 million Australian families. The milestone comes as new data from the Department of Education reveals that childcare costs had soared by 49 per cent under the previous government. From July, the Albanese government is taking action to deliver that real cost of living relief. And we know for uh, parents of, who have um, children under the age of five just what a hit uh, those childcare costs are to the uh, weekly household budget. For the average family on about $120,000 a year with a child in care three days a week, the changes will cut costs by about $1,700 a year. The childcare subsidy rates will lift to 90 per cent for families on a combined income of $80,000 or less, and the highest subsidies uh, of up to 95 per cent for families with second Thank and subsequent Minister. children Senator will be Payman, retained. Second supplementary. Can the minister confirm, in the lead-up to the budget, any further support from the government to combat the cost of living? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and I thank Senator Payman for her supplementary. We are taking action, and as this chamber knows, because we debated them in December last year. Uh, we want to take the sting out of how higher power prices through direct energy bill relief through the next budget direct support for households and businesses that, let us not forget, those opposite tried to block. There are encouraging signs that our plan on energy uh, prices are beginning to work, with big drops in the prices on the electricity futures market. We're also focused on growing the economy in the right way so more Australians can get the benefit from good skills, get good jobs and, enjoy, and earn good wages. That's why we successfully argued for the Fair Work Commission minimum wage increase in line with inflation. So uh, we've got legislation around cleaner and cheaper energy. We've brought in a new pensioner work bonus. We're, we're working on the new housing accord and we've got important legislation before this chamber that will assist with cost of living pressures on Australian households. Thank you, Your time Ooh. has expired. Senator Ben. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. According to government analysis, by how much have rental rates gone up since the election of the Albanese Labor government? Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Van for the um, uh, for the uh, the question. Uh, <clears throat> look, I don't, I don't I don't think we want to start this, uh, or certainly I don't want to start this process of uh, trying to score sort of political points on on cheap, 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 cheap. cheap. Cheap political, cheap political uh, point scoring. Um, I, I, um, uh, Minister Farrell, uh, Senator Birmingham. President, uh, I think the minister is impugning motives from Senator Van in what was otherwise a question entirely seeking a point of fact. Now Murray's bringing the, uh, the some some talking points toward to the table for poor Don. But I think you should bring him to order in terms Thank of including motives on the senator who purely senator asked Birmingham, a factual please question. Please resume your seat. I... Order, 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 order. 
Um, I don't believe there was an imputation against the actual senator. Um, so I'm going to call the minister and remind him of the question and the need for an answer. Um, senator Van. Uh, point of order on relevance. The uh, minister has gone nowhere near the question. Uh, Senator, Van, other than Senator Van, if you were listening, you would have heard me draw the minister back to the question. Minister Farrell. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, President. And um, what, what I, rather than sort of answering cheap political um, uh, questions, uh, what I'd like to talk about is. What, what I'd like to do is talk about what this government is actually doing in practical terms uh, to put the, uh, downward pressure on, uh, on the rental stress that so many, so many Australians are now suffering. Um, and uh, obviously, obviously one, of the things, one of the things that we can do is try and boost uh, the supply of uh, homes to rent. Uh, and uh, substantial and significant investment in new social and affordable housing. It's, it's, it's these things, uh, Senator Van, which will result in practical downward pressure on the rental stress that Australians that are, that are on the uh, Australian people right Minister at the Farrell, moment. Minister please resume your seat. Um, Senator Birmingham. Order on the question of direct relevance. This was quite a precise question. I accept the minister is being generally relevant to the question of rental markets and rental affordability, but there was a precise question there about how much rental rates have gone up. If the minister doesn't know, he can take it on notice and provide Thank context, you. but simply talking around the margins of it is not directly relevant. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Birmingham. I um, am not privy to what government analysis uh, Senator Van is directing us towards, but I will remind uh, Senator Birmingham, please. I, Senator Birmingham, I have taken your point of order in good faith. I am simply explaining to you I am not aware how broad or how narrow the government analysis is, but I will direct the minister to the second part of the question. Minister. Thank you, President. And a little bit of respect uh, from the leader for the chair uh, would be um, uh, would be appreciated. Yes, seriously. Yes, yes, yes. Seriously, a little bit of respect for the president. This, a little bit of respect. Now we know we know a whole Minister lot of people Farrell. across Australia. Mr. Farrell, uh, please resume your seat, Senator Van. And again, direct relevance. I mean, the minister cannot just. Waffle on, um, on down a Senator different Van, path. Senator Van, your leader was on his feet with the exact same question. I have directed the minister to the question. Chair, no, he hasn't I've, listened. No, it's not. You've you've raised a point of order. I've responded to that. Your leader raised exactly the same point of order. I've directed the minister to the question, um, and it's not for you to debate it with me, Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. And if your side stopped inter uh, interjecting, then I could answer your question because we know Thank a lot you, of people Minister across Farrell. Australia are struggling. Minister Farrell, their time has expired. Senator Van. Um, uh, given the success with that one, um, can the minister, or according to government analysis, how much more is an average standard variable mortgage rate holder paying per month on an average mortgage? since the election of the Albanese Labor government. Thank you, Senator Van. Minister Farrell. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, um, President, and I uh, thank uh, uh, Senator Van for his uh, supplementary question. Well, again, I'm not going to get into gotcha questions. Um, the government, the, this government, this government is trying to put downward pressure on uh, a whole lot of uh, items that um, are uh, making life difficult for ordinary Australian. Uh, Minister Farrell, Senator Van. President, again, direct relevance. The question was quite narrow in its phrasing, um, and if the minister doesn't know the answer, he can take it on notice and come back to the chamber. Um, thank you, Senator Van. The, the minister did respond to the question, but I'll draw him back to the question again. Minister. Thank you, uh, President, uh, and. Uh, 
We, we understand the pressures that Australian families are under. We've talked previously in your previous question about the issue of uh, rental affordability. Now you're talking about the issue of, uh, of mortgage rates. Um, we um, have been working solidly to put downward pressure um, on all of these, uh, all of these uh, items that are affecting ordinary working um, Australians. Now, Thank you, Minister. Um, the time for answering has expired. Um, second supplementary, Senator Van. Thank you, President. Given the Minister has demonstrated he is unaware of or unconcerned by the cost of living pressures faced by Australians, is he aware that Westpac Business Bank forecasts advertised rents will increase by 11.5 per cent in 2023? And Minister, is it correct that this will be the biggest annual increase on record? Thank you, Senator Van, Minister. Thank you, President. Thank you, President, and thank uh, um, Senator Van for his uh, second supplementary question. I, I completely reject your proposition. Uh, Senator Van, this is a government that's deeply concerned about cost of living issues facing ordinary, ordinary, ordinary Australian people. Um, we've, we can, we, uh, we every day, we every day, we every day focus on how we can put downward pressure on the cost of living, based on the financial mess that you. Uh, left us and we inherited when we came to government almost 12 months ago. Um, we, we're, we're facing, Australians are facing these issues because of the inaction and um, the neglect of the former government in respect of all of these issues. Uh, bit by bit, inch Thank by you, inch, day the by day, we're has taking. Expired. As Senator Rice. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Communications, um, Senator Watt. Minister, across the country, state governments are proposing actions to limit gambling because of the harm it causes to children and the community. And reflecting this, the Greens in New South Wales are taking a policy to the election on Saturday of phasing out pokey machines from pubs and clubs, introducing a mandatory cashless gambling card and creating a pokey super tax and reparation fund for affected communities. But it's up to the federal government to ban gambling advertising, which is something that is supported by 70 per cent of Australians. Minister, will the government move to ban gambling advertising anywhere, anytime, in the same way as tobacco advertising was banned years ago? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Rice. Uh, thank you for giving us an election manifesto from the New South Wales Greens. Um, the uh, I'm not sure, Senator Rice, where, whether you were here yesterday when I pretty much answered an identical question from Senator Pocock. Um, so I could refer you back to my answer yesterday, um, but I'm happy to go through it again today. Um, there is no doubt that the Albanese government recognises the importance of gambling promotions being presented in a responsible manner. Uh, and we know the Greens know a little bit about gambling because we know who their donors have been. Uh, we also recognise there is ongoing community concern about the harms associated with online gambling, including advertising material, and it is timely for the parliament to consider what more should be done to address this issue. And I, I, I hope that we can rely on the Greens' support despite their large donations from gambling uh, in interests. Uh, this is why we have established an inquiry on, into online gambling and its impacts on those experiencing gambling harm. And as I mentioned yesterday, that inquiry is being conducted by the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs, which, as I mentioned yesterday, is being very capably chaired by uh, uh, Peter Murphy, uh, one of our fabulous Labor MPs. The committee is considering the effectiveness of current gambling advertising restrictions on limiting children's exposure to gambling products and services, including through social media, sponsorship or branding, among a range of other issues. Of course, the government will consider the committee's recommendations when it releases its final report. The current rules relating to the scheduling and content of advertisements on television are contained in the co-regulatory broadcasting codes of practice. 
Those codes are developed under the Broadcasting Services Act 1992 by industry groups in consultation with the Australian Communications and Media Authority. Uh, there is some work to be done here. The Albanese government is on the job. There's a House committee on the job, and Thank we look you, forward Senator to seeing Watt. its recommendations. The time for has expired. Senator Rice, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. So, in terms of a ban at this stage, it's a no. Um, Minister, it was a Labor government that refused tobacco donations and introduced changes to tobacco packets that protected people to reduce harm. Will you commit to refusing gambling donations and taking action to protect people from gambling harm? Minister Watt. Well, thank you, President. Again, I'm rather surprised that the, that the Greens are choosing to use a question about uh, whether we will ban the very kind of donations that the Greens have been receiving. So, so you're asking a Labor government to ban you from taking donations from the gambling industry? Um, is Minister that what this Watt, is about? Please resume your seat, Senator Wright. Yeah, look, point of order, President. Um, the minister is misleading the parliament. The Greens do not Senator take Rice, donations not, from Senator gambling Rice. companies. Senator Rice, that's a debating point. Minister Watt. Minister Watt, please continue. Um, there's a briefing here. Minister Watt, I've called three times. Sorry, President. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just so surprised that, <laughs> that the Greens are asking us to stop them from taking donations that they have been taking for a number of years from the gambling industry. Uh, I mean, let me remind you, Senator Rice, in 2022, the Queensland Greens accepted almost $500,000 in donations from a high roll— $500,000! Oh, $500,000 from a high-rolling gambler, despite pushing for a ban on political donations from the gambling industry. Uh, uh, in 2019-20, the Queensland Greens MP, Mr Berkman, had been critical of the LNP and Labor for accepting donations from gambling interests, uh, but the highest donation in an election year in Queensland in 2019 um, was indeed to the Greens from Mr Two. Um, Senator Rice. It's time. It is time. Yes. yes. I'll, I'll <laughs> it's take time you to, to your... refuse Second donations from da gambling companies. Gambling companies. Order. Yeah, the gambling industry, gambling countries. Minister, yeah, uh, it's the Senator industry. Rice. It's the insidious, harmful industry. Senator Minister Rice, just please uh, resume your seat because I can't hear you and the chamber needs to come to order. 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 I, I haven't heard the question and I don't think Senator Rice has finished the question, but um, would you start it again, please? I haven't Order. started the question. I'm just correcting the record. Minister, it is clear that what is needed at a federal level is a national gambling regulator, including to tackle the harm caused by online gambling, which is national and international. Will the government introduce a national gambling regulator? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. Well, as I say, the, the government, uh, the House of Representatives, is conducting an inquiry into these matters at the moment, and I, I do look forward to its recommendations on what we can do about what is a very serious issue. Um, but, but I'm interested to note that Senator Rice um, seems to be enunciating the Greens' position is that they don't support gambling donations from companies, but donations from individual high roller gambles are fine. So. Does that mean that every time we hear the Greens say that we should ban donations from coal and gas companies, that would be okay for the Greens to take donations from Clive Palmer, who owns coal companies, or Gina Reinhart? So, so no to their companies, but fine for their. Uh, I mean, Mr. Turpey, the high roller gambler, has been. The, the Greens don't like it when they're held to account, and Senator McKim is chief among them. You come in here and mouth off constantly about what other parties should do, but the very minute your own hypocrisy is exposed, all you want to do is shout people down. You are a uh, joke, you are you, a Senator hypocrite, Watt. and you're your finally being exposed. Expired. Order. Senator Watt, I do remind you to direct your marks to the chair. Um, Senator Green. <laughs> Senator Green. <laughs> Thank you, President. My question is to the Special Minister of State, Senator Farrell. On, on this historic day, can the Minister update the Senate about the progress to recognise First Nations Australians in the Constitution and to deliver an Indigenous voice to Parliament? Yeah. Minister Farrell. Uh, yes, um, I can, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Senator Green, and uh, thank you for the question and your great interest in this uh, topic. And I should start by congratulating everybody in this uh, uh, Parliament or in the Senate 
uh, for the mature way in which the issue of the referendum uh, legislation was dealt with last, uh, last night and uh, congratulate yourselves on, uh, on uh, passing of that uh, legislation uh, without any opposition in this place. But it is another historic day today, um, uh, a significant day in the journey towards uh, an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. And we've had the opportunity for Australia to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia in our constitution. Uh, this will be a simple but powerful act. The proposition that, that it is to be put to the uh, Australian people has been built from the ground up through the work of the uh, Uluru Statement from the Heart. Uh, this process uh, is the culmination of years of discussion, consultation and hard work by, Australian, uh, so by uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. As the Prime Minister said in his gracious and, and uh, patient ask of Australia, I want to thank the Chamber for the goodwill, uh, of course, demonstrated last night um, in, the, uh, in respect of the uh, referendum machinery bill. This will be the first referendum in almost a quarter of a century where a new generation of Australians will be able to have their say. The government believes this referendum will be a unifying uh, moment uh, for Australia, and I'm certainly keen for that to be the case. It's about taking this country forward for everyone. We look forward to working with the Australian community to ensure everyone can have their say in a respectful manner on this important opportunity to recognise our first Australians. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Senator Green, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, ahead of the voice referendum, what is the government doing to implement Labor's long-standing commitment to improve voter enrolment and participation? Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. And again, thank uh, um, Senator Green for uh, that question and her interest in, uh, in uh, voter uh, enrolment. <coughs> and since we took office, uh, we've wasted no time on this issue. Last year, I asked JSCAM to investigate increasing enfranchisement and electoral participation and look forward to work, working across the parliament on meaningful reform following its report. Last year, the government allocated $16.1 million to the Australian Electoral Commission over two years to increase First Nations enrolment and participation in future electoral events as part of the referendum preparatory work. More recently, I approved regulatory changes making it easier uh, for more Australians eligible to enrol to actually get on the roll. From the uh, 17th of February, el eligible Australians have been able to use their Medicare car and their Australian citizenship certificate numbers to enrol and uh, or update their enrolment. Thank Early you, AEC Minister, the time for answering has expired. Senator Green, a second supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, Minister, it is important that First Nations people have their say at this referendum. Can the Minister update the Senate about the steps the government is taking to improve Indigenous enrolment particularly? Thank you, Senator Green. Minister. Thank you, President. Uh, and I can say, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Green, I can say that early uh, AEC data from around the country shows that between 11 and 14 per cent of new enrolment applications uh, using those new methods of uh, enrolment that I mentioned uh, before. Uh, one outstanding uh, initiative from the Gillard Labor government was the Federal Direct Enrolment Update Program, which uses information uh, from the government agencies to assist with updating uh, elector detail, elector details <clears throat> and including eligible voters on the roll. Following trials of the new direct enrolment activities, uh, which used new data sources, mailbag addresses and email notifications of new enrolments, the AEC advises that over 15,000 Indigenous Australians were added to the electoral roll. Following these successful trials, the AEC advises me that these activities uh, will be included as a permanent feature of our enrolment program. The estimated uh, Indigenous enrolment Thank you, rates... Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. Um, this question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Housing, Senator Farrell, and it has no preamble. How many homes will Tasmania get under the Housing Australia Future Fund in the first five years? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. <coughs> thank you, uh, thank you uh, Senator uh, um, Tyrrell, and uh, thank you uh, for uh, your interest in this uh, uh, this. Uh, 
uh, initiative of the, uh, of the uh, federal uh, <coughs> government to uh, try and uh, increase the uh, number of, um, uh, number of uh, and access to uh, homes by uh, ordinary, uh, ordinary uh, Australians. Um, um, we Order. Thank you, thank you, uh, President. Um, uh, we're, in, we're ensuring, uh, through um, a range of significant policy uh, initiatives, that uh, Australians have uh, greater access not only to home ownership but also to um, uh, greater rental, rental uh, affordability. Minister Farrell, um, um, please resume your seat. Senator Tyrrell. Point of order, um, Chair. Um, relevance, I ask for a very specific question. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Senator Tyrrell. I'll remind the uh, Minister of your que question. Um, thank you, uh, President. And um, of course, um, uh, as uh, unfortunately, as data has uh, shown, that uh, in the period from uh, 2016 to 2021, there was uh, regrettably a substantial increase in uh, Tasmanians uh, experiencing uh, homelessness. And I think this is uh, really what your uh, question is uh, directed uh, to. Um, Tasmania has a strong community housing provider sector and has taken many opportunities provided by the uh, National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation. Uh, of course, uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Tyrrell. I know I'm new, but I thought it was a very plain question. Thank you. I have directed the minister to your question and I will direct him once again. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister. <laughs> So just recently, um, Minister Rick Collins was in Launceston to uh, turn the sod on the site of 48 uh, affordable uh, new homes for Tasmanians in need, with the Community Housing Order. Provider Community Order. Housing uh, <coughs> Limited. The Albanese government has unlocked up to $575 million in funding from the National Housing Infrastructure Facility to be able to invest in new. Social Thank you, Minister. And affordable. The time for answering has expired. Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, President. The government's commitment that Housing Australia Future Fund will make independent decisions is admirable. With that commitment in mind, though, who decided the fund would allocate 10,000 homes to frontline workers? Uh, thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Farrell. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, um, President, and uh, thanks, uh, Senator Tyrrell, for Order. her uh, her question. Um, um, the issue that uh, you've just raised, of course, um, was an election promise that the uh, uh, Albanese government took to um, the last uh, the last election. Um, um, so, in terms of who. Uh, who decided that uh, issue? Well, of course, um, it's, it was the Australian people because uh, the Australian people elected the uh, Albanese government uh, to, um, to be the government of this country. And, of course, what we are doing now um, with, with our housing policies is implementing those decisions which we took to, um, uh, to the people at the last, uh, the last election. So, uh, in terms of uh, who decided this, well, ultimately, um, it was. Minister Farrell, the, the time for answering Sorry. has expired. Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. Okay. Thank you, President. Um, on, on, on current projections, in the next five years, 1,100 Tasmanians will be homeless. Does your government agree that reducing homelessness by building 1,200 homes in Tasmania is a good thing? Uh, thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Um, look, <clears throat> to be honest with you, uh, Senator uh, Tyrrell, I think you're just focusing on one small aspect of what the government is proposing to do. Let me let me tell you let me tell you about some of the things this government is doing by comparison to what the previous government uh, <coughs> uh, did not do. Uh, Senator um, Minister Farrell, we, uh, please resume your uh, seat. Minister Farrell, order on my left. Uh, Senator Watt, I've just called the chamber to order, Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Um, $10 billion investment to improve housing outcomes in Australia. Uh, 20,000 social uh, homes, including 4,000 homes for women and children 
impacted by domestic violence and older women at risk of uh, homelessness. Uh, 10,000 affordable homes for frontline workers. Uh, $30 million for housing and services for, 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 for veterans. $200 million to repair, maintain and improve housing in remote uh, Indigenous Minister communities. Carroll, please resume your seat. Senator Tyrrell. Mr. President, look, I appreciate all that they're doing, but it was a very simple question, and I'm here to represent Tasmania. Not Thank the you. Government. I will again uh, direct the minister to your question, Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Uh, well, Senator Tyrrell, all of those things, all of those things are things that. Thank you, this Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Yesterday, during question time, you declared to the Senate what the Prime Minister Albanese says he does. Yeah. Mr Albanese said not once but on 97 separate occasions that Australians were going to see a reduction of $275 in their power bills. Minister, when will Australians get a $275 reduction to their power bills? Thank you. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan, Minister Farrell. Um, thank you. Uh, order on my right. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, the Senator for, uh, for his question, which uh, seems to be a repeat of uh, questions uh, asked uh, earlier, earlier in the week. And I have to say, I have to say on a day, a historic day, when um, um, the Prime Minister announces uh, the recognition of an Indigenous voice to Parliament, here I am at the third question. Third question. Uh, where we haven't had a single, a single question about the Order. big issue of the day. Order. Now, the um, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Relevance. Clearly, my question was about electricity bills and the prices that Australians can expect to pay, and we're getting an answer Thank on the voice. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. I will draw the minister to the question. Minister Farrell. Um, Prime Minister Albanese, just like myself, is deeply concerned about the issue of electricity. Electricity, President, the Prime Minister, Senator the Prime Cash. Minister, and uh, myself are deeply concerned about the issue of uh, of electricity prices in this country for ordinary working Australians and businesses, for that matter. Now, the the reality is that the reason. The reason, the reason that we uh, find ourselves in a situation with escalating electricity prices is the ten, the ten, ten long years of inaction uh, by the former government on the, the uh, pressures in relation to uh, electricity prices and, of course, the issue of climate change. Now, what did we do as soon as the Prime Minister? What did we do as soon as we came into government? We took action. We took. We took action on electricity prices. We sought to put a cap on gas Order. prices. We sought Order. to put a cap on gold coal prices to push the price of electricity down. And what did your mob do? What did your mob do? You voted against it. You wanted to keep electricity Thank you, prices Thank high. You, you the wanted time to keep electricity. Answering has expired. Minister, uh, Senator O'Sullivan, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Does Labor's Powering Australia plan say, and I quote, it will cut power prices for families and businesses by $275 a year? Uh, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, President. Um, look, um, we've taken all of the action that we've done in respect of power prices to put downward pressure, downward pressure on electricity prices in this country to repair the neglect of the previous nine years of neglect from your, your, your government. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, yeah, point of order on direct relevance. The question asked very simply whether or not uh, the, the Labor's Powering Australia plan will say it will cut power prices power bills for families and businesses by $225 Thank a year. Thank you. Uh, Senator it, O'Sullivan, I, I, seek leave I will. To, Senator to O'Sullivan. Senator O'Sullivan, please resume your seat. Senator O'Sullivan, you were on a point of order. Well, there was so much interjection, it was very hard to hear. The, um, I will rule on the point of order. I will direct uh, the minister to your question, and I will also uh, 
ask the minister to. Um, you're seeking leave now. Yes. I seek leave. Is leave to... granted? Well, I haven't. I haven't explained what. Leave is President... not granted. Order. President... Order. Pre with respect, President. Uh, no, it's not with respect, Senator O'Sullivan. I asked. I asked if leave was granted, and the answer was no. It's. There's no point debating it with me. Please resume your seat. I have the minister on his feet. Thank you, Thank you uh, President. It is customary when uh, somebody is seeking to table a document to. Um, um, well, look. We don't know I, that. I, 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 I don't know. Order. I don't know. I don't know what. I don't know what the senator has got in his uh, uh, in his hand. Um, the the leader the leader yesterday um, had the courtesy. To uh, hand me a copy of the document that he wanted to uh, uh, put uh, forward, and uh, I'm happy to look at any document which um, the opposition seeks to uh, to table and uh, respond. Thank you. So, before I come to you, Senator Birmingham, Senator O'Sullivan, the minister has invited you to show him the document so he may consider the um, response. Senator Birmingham. Thank, thank you, President. Uh, on indulgence, given the invitation of the acting leader of the government in the Senate, here it is. And perhaps you'd like to read the highlighted line to the chamber. Senator Birmingham. Um, so I, we're going to go back to the question. I've asked the minister to um, respond to the question and to be relevant to the question. Minister. Love it. I'm ready, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, President. And. Uh, um, look, Order. I, I, I don't think I can be any clearer about uh, the actions that this government has been taking to reduce the price of electricity in this country for uh, both— Minister, please resume your seat. Senator O'Sullivan. Just, yep. just a moment, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Watt. Senator O'Sullivan. Point of order on direct relevance. The question was very tight, and we assisted the minister by providing him Labor's policy. Um, Senator O'Sullivan, in relation to Senator Watt, seriously. Order. The minister has agreed to look at what you're seeking to table. Uh, in relation to your question and your last point of order, I have directed him to the question. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you President. Um, um, look, this government is serious about putting downward pressure on electricity prices. Um, we came to office uh, with um, a former government with something like 22. Thank you, Minister. Um, the time for answering has expired. Senator O'Sullivan, second supplementary. Will the Minister say the words $275? Uh, Minister Farrell. I am going to sit the minister down again until there is respectful silence from both sides. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Gallagher. Uh, minister, please continue. Thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank. Uh, uh, the senator for his uh, second uh, supplementary uh, question. Um, uh, this government um, is serious about putting downward pressure on electricity prices. I don't think I can. I don't think I can be any clearer than that. And from right from the time, right from the time, right from the time that we took office. We started uh, taking Farrell, action. Minister Farrell, we... please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, you are clearly out of order, and I would ask you to listen in respectful silence. Minister Farrell. Um, we started taking action on putting downward pressure, downward pressure on electricity Minister prices Farrell, in a please way. Please resume your seat. Senator O'Sullivan. Direct relevance, Minister, uh, President. I asked the question, will the minister say the words $275, because that's what they promised uh, thank to the you, Australian Senator people. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. I will direct the minister to your question. Minister Farrell. Um, well, can I say this, uh, um, Senator? I, 
I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be have uh, not, not going to have words or amounts put into my mouth. Um, we have been we have been the government. We have been the government. We have been the government with the opposition uh, uh, thank you, uh, opposed to Time cutting for electricity. Has expired. Senator Babette. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Having previously denied a link between money printing and inflation, RBA Governor Dr Philip Lowe finally admitted during recent Senate estimates that the expansion of the money supply, low interest rates and government support during the pandemic has driven inflation. Prior to the 2022 election, the former coalition government ran up hundreds of billions of dollars of debt with little to show for it but some expired PCR tests and, of course, an artificially inflated property market, where it's nearly impossible for first home buyers to get into the market. Now, do you believe that the irresponsible and unprecedented debt accumulated by the former government has contributed to the inflationary pressures that are currently being felt by ordinary Australians? And I will remind you as well that the Labor Party was also in agreement with most of this. Thank you, thank Senator Babette. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President, and I thank Senator Babette for the question and also for um, his, his advice that he would be asking a question relating to uh, debt and um, inflation. Uh, and I would agree with Senator Babette that um, the significant increase in government debt that was um, that was um, increased under the former government. Uh, a lot of that, double, uh, they doubled the debt before the pandemic hit, um, has certainly led to the budget being in worse shape um, than it needed to be, and that there wasn't enough to show for the debt that we currently carry, and that, that managing that debt burden is the fastest growing area in the budget, is managing the interest burden on that debt. So it is a big problem and it is a big issue that we are having to manage uh, as we work our way through um, the decisions we're taking in this budget. I think uh, the inflation challenge has certainly been made worse by the failure in energy policy, um, nine years of failure to deal with the reality of a changing energy market and the fact that we haven't been able to be ahead of that and have in place policies that have been able to deal with it has certainly contributed because uh, one of the biggest contributors to inflation, of course, has been energy prices, impacted by the war in Ukraine, but absolutely also impacted by the failure of those opposite to land and an agreed energy policy. 22 of them, not one of them landed, and the fact that we are now dealing with uh, the results of that has certainly been uh, had an impact on inflation, which is why we took the steps we took at the end of last year uh, to put in place caps, to put in place the interventions that we did, um, unusual as they were, to make sure we were putting downward pressure on inflation you, and bills the at the same time. Has expired. Senator Babeb, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Now, I guess we're in agreement now that uh, increased government spending does indeed contribute to high inflation. So, why is the government, the Labor government, not responsibly attempting to heavily reduce spending to balance the budget and to actually make a start on repaying our nation's debt? Why all the big spending? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, and I thank Senator Babette uh, for the supplementary. Well, I would say to Senator Babette, the October um, budget banked 99 per cent of the revenue upgrades uh, that we received um, through that budget, through that budget update. 99 per cent. It's, it's unprecedented. And I think that goes to show the approach that the Treasurer, Dr Chalmers and I, uh, take in terms of budget management. And it's not just how much you spend, it's the quality of the spend. Is the, the invest, are the investments you're making driving an economic outcome, an economic or social outcome? So our childcare investments, our investments in, in cleaner and cheaper energy, our investments in, in medicines, uh, all of those things. It's about the quality of the spend. We don't want to pork barrel our way around the country like those opposite did. We need to make sure that every dollar that's spent is invested in the productive capacity of our country and improves the living standards of Australians. 
Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Burbett, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. So I guess it's pretty clear that governments, all governments, lack the courage to cut spending because it's unpleasant to do so. Now, will you rule out future taxes on the family home and will you confirm that your government will proceed with the stage three tax cuts to ensure that Australians can keep more of their own money and keep up with the rising costs of living? Thank you. Thank you, Senator Babette, Minister. Thank you. Well, on the question um, around uh, taxes on the family home, um, we understand the importance of the family home, and it, it will remain exempt from capital gains tax. I think the Prime Minister um, and Treasurer have made that clear in recent weeks, and our position on stage three hasn't changed. On the spending side, um, I think we do need to acknowledge that significant amounts, the, the vast proportion of spending in the Commonwealth budget is in payments um, through our social security system and payments to the states and territories. Um, these are you know, significant parts of the budget. So when people say they want you know, to see big cuts to things, you have to be understanding that that means uh, big cuts to sort of social programs that people value um, or payments to the states and territories. So we are, going to be, we are fiscally responsible. We, are, we do have an eye on budget repair, but we're going to be cautious uh, about how we approach it because we know people rely on services that the Australian Thank budget funds. Thank you, Minister. Funds. The time for answering has expired. Senator White. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. Um, Victoria has one of the largest uh, Indian diasporas in Australia, and so they're extremely interested in the Prime Minister's Albanese's recent um, trip to India. I have met, had many constituents ask me about it, and I, I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate further on what uh, Prime Minister Albanese's um, discussions with Prime Minister Modi uh, were about and uh, provi provide an update on how Aussie farmers will benefit from the Prime Minister's recent trip to India. Uh, thank you, Senator White. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. And isn't it good that one senator in this chamber has some questions about agriculture? Uh, and I'm not surprised it comes from come, and India, and India. And it's not surprising that it comes from Senator White, who comes from good farming stock herself. Uh, and I know not that long ago attended a very important event with the dairy industry in Tatura, just outside Shepparton, and I thank her for doing so. Well, the Prime Minister's recent trip to India, where he, of course, was triumphantly accompanied by his diligent trade minister, Senator Farrell, was obviously a great success. And it really underscored the value of the relationship between our two countries, because this is a relationship that runs far deeper than just on the cricket field. India was Australia's sixth largest two-way goods and services trading partner at $34.3 billion last year, and that number is continuing to grow. And much like Australia, agriculture is a massive part of India's economy and its identity. And that's why it was so exciting to announce that Australia and India had agreed on two-way agricultural trade to provide new market access for Australian Hass avocados to India and access for Indian okra to Australia. This is a significant market access opportunity for Australian avocado producers, and the good people of India will now be introduced to the, to the wonders of smashed avocado, whether it be on a Saturday morning or any other day, uh, right, across, right across India. The opening of this new export market has been estimated by industry as having a potential market value of approximately $25 million. So it's not surprising that this deal, negotiated by the Albanese government, has been welcomed by industry groups across Order. the board, including. Uh, including the Australian Fresh Produce uh, Association, who said this new access is expected to provide a significant boost to the Australian avocado industry, supporting the sector's continued growth over the long term. And unsurprisingly, Avocados Australia backed in the announcement, saying it's a tremendous achievement, and our growers and packers are Thank very you, keen Minister. to prepare the their businesses for, for India. Has expired. Senator White, first supplementary. Uh, thanks very much for acknowledging my family's history with Tatura, uh, where uh, my my grandparents were interned and did in fact work in uh, uh, agriculture. So I appreciate that acknowledgement. 
acknowledgement of those great people. During his visit, uh, Prime Minister Albanese also welcomed the recent entry into the force of, the, uh, of ECTA. Can the minister explain how the ECTA is already be benefiting Aussie farmers? And ECTA, of course, is the India-Australia Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement. Thank you, Senator White. Minister White. I'd, I'd be delighted. Uh, I'd be delighted, delighted to do so, Senator White. And again, it's, it's good to have people on one side of the chamber who actually have real experience in agriculture going back decades, rather than people who just like to talk a lot about it. Uh, I know some of us have got a little hobby farm outside Warwick. You know, we whack on the RMs on the weekend and get the old ride-on mower out and, you know, put on the hat. But there's a few people who actually care about agriculture and, uh, and know a little bit about it. Uh, previously, exports to India peaked at 3.38 billion Australian dollars in 2016 Order. Order. on the back of then record grain and pulse production. But changes to Indian tariffs on grains and pulses resulted in reduced Australian production, Order. which had a massive impact on farmers across the country. The India-Australia Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement came into force on December 2022, and it's already proving to be a win for Aussie farmers. Uh, not only is it opening up new markets for our top quality products, but we're also seeing the removal or reduction of tariffs on existing trade. This prevents, pre Thank presents you, great Minister opportunities White, for Australian time farmers. The has expired. Um, Senator White's uh, order. Senator White, second supplementary. Thank you so much for that answer. Can the minister outline what the Albanese government is doing to support Aussie farmers, processors and exporters to take advantage of the new market access opportunities like those with India? Uh, minister Watt. Thank you again, uh, Senator White. And you know, whether it be the, the wilds of Warwick or the uh, the coffee shops of Elwood. We know the, co the coalition are very strong when it comes to, a to agriculture. Uh, Watt, the Albanese Minister government Watt, is focused Minister on opening. Watt, resume your seat. Once again, the interjections are disorderly. I would ask you to listen in silence, Minister Watt. <laughs> uh, Senator, Senator McGrath. Senator McGrath. May I remind you to stand and wait for me to come to you? That is a good reminder. The, a direct relevance uh, to, to the question that was asked, as, as much as, as Warwick has some wild areas, uh, particularly McGrath, at my local pub, which you should come to sometime, Senator McGrath, Minister, um, Senator I'd McGrath. ask the Minister to... Senator McGrath, that is not a point of order. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, the Albanese government is focused on opening doors for Australia's agriculture and processing industries to grow and diversify their overseas markets. Uh, India's large population and diversifying Order. economy is creating new demand for premium and healthy produce, which uh, Australia is well placed to deliver on. Specifically, rising consumer incomes and increasing rates of urbanisation in India mean that opportunities are likely to be con concentrated in the rapidly growing high-end produce market. These are the types of opportunities that will present themselves because of other key free trade agreements uh, which are still being finalised, including with the UK and the EU. Uh, it's hoped that the UK deal will be finalised shortly, which would be a major boost to, our Austra to Australia's beef, lamb and, in particular, our sugar industry. And I want to acknowledge all the work Thank of people Senator from Daft, Deepak and others who has expired. As Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Um, uh, I regrettably ask that uh, further questions uh, be put on the notice paper and uh, happy to, happy to accept um, the uh, Powering Australia policy, which I recommend all of the coalition to read. To, to read. Thank you. Senator Colby. All answers given to coalition questions by government ministers today, um, albeit with some reluctance, Deputy President, because I don't think that we could, with any level of satisfaction, say that any, answer, any question was answered today. The government has 
clearly no respect for the process of question time, has no respect for the entreaties of the President of the Chamber, who repeatedly brought Minister Farrell back to the question, uh, entreaties that were continuously ignored uh, by Minister Farrell. And it's a real tragedy that questions that are being asked quite genuinely by members of the opposition around the cost of living, the government's promises to reduce power prices by $275, a number that uh, Minister Farrell refuses to utter, um, were ignored by the leader in the, of the government in the Senate, or the acting leader of the government in the Senate. It appears that the only thing that we have learnt, Mr. Uh, uh, acting Deputy President or Deputy President, is that Labor's promises are effectively 100 per cent renegable. We hear a lot about 100 per cent renewable, but the Labor Party's promises are clearly 100 per cent renegable. They're not interested in the fact that they promised Australians a reduction in power prices by $275. They're not interested in the fact that they promised Australians cheaper mortgages. They're not interested in the fact that they promises, promised no changes to superannuation. Uh, they are not interested in their promises that they, Australians would see lower inflation. Uh, they're not interested in any of their problems. The concern that Senator Farrell continues to express isn't going to pay higher power bills. It isn't going to pay higher mortgage costs. The concern isn't going to cover the costs of additional inflation. This government went to the election promising the Australian people that it had a plan to deal with the Australian economy. And all we see during question time is this government trying to deflect the problems to somebody else. They don't have the courage to stand up in here and take the responsibility for the decisions that they've made. I mean, only a Labor government could spend $1.5 billion to see power prices go up. I mean, only a Labor government could do that. We, we know, because we remember, Deputy President, we remember that it took the coalition six years, six years, to get the budget back to an even keel after the last time Labor were in government. It took the coalition six years to do that. And they've started it in exactly the same way that they've left off. The Parliamentary Budget Office told us in the lead up to the election, and it's been proven since, they are spending more money. So higher spending, higher deficits than the coalition. So started the same way they left off last time. And so why would we expect any different? Why would we expect any different? During the time we were in government, they wanted to spend three hundred dollars for every Australian to get them, get them vaccinated. Six billion dollars extra that, that didn't need to be spent because Australians lined up to be vaccinated, Mr Deputy President. So we're seeing the same chaos. But worse, but worse, a complete disrespect for the Australian people, a complete disrespect for the promises that they made to them just 10 months ago. All of those commitments. We have a plan to manage the Australian economy. Where's any sign of that plan? They promised a reduction in, in, in energy bills of $275. And the only thing Australians are seeing, Deputy President, is power prices going up and no sign of anything else. They promised that they had a plan to deal with inflation. And where's the evidence of the plan in the context of that? Because inflation is at, at recent high levels at over 7 per cent. And they pay no respect to the process in this place because we did not effectively get a single answer to a single question today where the minister did nothing but try and palm off responsibility, not answer the question, deflect responsibility to somebody else, but not being prepared to stand up and have the courage, as a government should, to take responsibilities, responsibility for the issues that are facing the Australian people, but much worse continue to break their promises to the Australian people. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. 
we on this side understand that the rising cost of living is hitting a lot of Australians hard, and inflation is the defining economic cha uh, challenge in 2023, as it was in 2022. Australians also understand that we didn't create these challenges, but they elected us to take responsibility for addressing them. Australians are dealing with the repercussions of almost a decade of the Liberal National Party's inaction on modernising the energy grid and on building strong relationships and facilitating a community where everyone is welcome and their individual <coughs> characteristics and skills are accepted and appreciated. Because we know that people are able to, if people are able to fully engage in society and the workforce when, when, they, can be, then they, when they can fearlessly be their authentic self. A study conducted by BetterUp found that when people were able to show up authentically at work. The workplace experiences 54 per cent lower turnover and 50 per cent increase in team performance, all of which supports an increase in productivity. That is why it must be noted that the actions of some hate-filled individuals outside this building today and outside parliaments across the country throughout the week, including in my home town of Hobart, must be called out. This hate has been countered by love, acceptance and community. I am proud to say that the views of the person fuelling this hate is not supported by the majority of Australians. The government certainly does not. This government stands with trans and non-binary folk. This is a government that believes equality is a core business. Unfortunately, some senators in this place have given oxygen to some, someone so damaging. The facts are so clear. 63.8 per cent of young people who identify as LGBTIQ plus have been diagnosed with mental health conditions. Compared to the general population, trans and gender diverse young people are seven times more likely to be diagnosed with depression. Even more distressingly, transgender young people are 15 times more likely to attempt suicide compared to the general population. Why there may be a handful of people trying to divide us, choosing to hate, choosing to discriminate and choosing to spread mistruths, there are many, many, many more standing in solidarity with trans and non-binary people. How can we tackle some of the most co corrosive issues in, in influencing the cost of living crisis if people, if people cannot be their authentic selves in society, because the risk of doing so is just too great. To increase productivity, workers must feel safe, supported and valued at work, no matter who you are or who you love. Trans people have a right to live in safety, to thrive, and just like everyone else, trans people should be treated with dignity and respect at every single stage of their lives. No one should ever have to experience such an invasion of their right to exist. So I want to make it clear to our strong trans and non-binary community You are welcome here and you are celebrated here. Our message is simple to the LGBTIQ plus community. No matter who you are or who you love, you should be valued, equaled, uh, equal and celebrated. I also would like to give a call out to those people in my home t state of Tasmania in my, and in my home town of Hobart and congratulate you for turning up and supporting your trans and non-binary people. I wish I could have been there with you, but unfortunately we were sitting. And I hope that the person fueling this hate understands that Australians do not stand with her. 
Senator Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And I thank uh, Senator Brown for her uh, warm and generous remarks, and I'm sure that many senators in this place uh, will support her. The matter that we're debating at this particular part of the schedule, though, is the question time. And it was quite revealing. Senator Farrell gave us an insight into the Prime Minister's morning routine. Yes. Senator Farrell said that the Prime Minister wakes up every morning and he thinks about what more he can be doing <laughs> to help Australian families. That will come as very cold comfort to those Australian families who wake up every morning and ask themselves, why is the Prime Minister, Mr Albanese, and why is the Treasurer, Mr Chalmers, making my family poorer? I think he needs to get up earlier. The cost of living crisis in this country is real, it is immediate, and the scale is serious. The best way to demonstrate that, of course, is with the data. So just think for a moment. A family who took out a loan at a fixed rate of 2.5 per cent for a loan on a residential property of about $450,000, remembering that the average loan in our country is $600,000, is now was paying, was paying $2,060 a month. Now it is paying at least $2,900 a month on a variable rate of about 5.8 per cent. That is an extra. That is an extra. $840 a month or $10,000 a year that an Australian family has to find. Now, Senator Green, I know, is sort of smirking and unsettled in her chair. Let's think about the scale. Uh, Senator Green, I've. I've... Oh, well, then. Through, 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 through me, th Senator Green, through me, I, I take the point of order. Well, Senator Smith, please. Members, member, members should be able to sit in the chamber without a reflection of their personal demeanour. Deputy President. So this fact will make senators uncomfortable. This fact will make Labor senators squirm. How many people, how many mortgages themselves do you think have shifted from fixed to variable? I know that you'll be thinking, I've heard that number before, I think that's about 880,000 880, uh, mortgages. I can see Senator Ayres nodding. That is correct. That is, that is the 2023 figure. That is this year's figure. What was the 2022 figure? That was 590,000. What is next year's figure? 450,000. What does that mean? 1.9 million. 1.9 million mortgages shifting from fixed to variable in the term of this government, and what is their plan for a remedy? What is their plan for a remedy? 1.9 million is the scale of the problem. Not my figure, Deputy President. Figures released yesterday by Senator Gallagher in a question on notice to me that was late in being responded to was late in being responded to. Not one day late, not two days late, weeks upon weeks of late. So why was it that the government thought it necessary to delay the return of my question on notice that revealed, that revealed 1.9 million mortgages shifting from fixed to variable rates over the life of this government? I know that Labor senators find it tiresome to listen to coalition senators talking about these issues. The issues are real. The issues are serious. They're on a scale that I think will surprise many, many people. So don't listen to Senator Smith. Let's listen to the ACT Secretary, Sally McManus. And what did she have to say? What did she have to say? She conceded, she conceded that real wages are going backwards, her word, by a shocking, Sally McManus's word, shocking, four and a half per cent, and that the wage rises of 2022 and early 2023 have now been, Sally McManus's words, eaten up by price rises and interest rate rises. The head of the Labor movement is saying that the government's lack of action, price rises, interest rate rises, are eating away those very, very modest gains uh, that people might have had in their wages. 
So when the Prime Minister wakes up tomorrow, I hope he will wake up with a renewed sense of urgency about the scale of the cost of living crisis that is impacting Australian families across the country. It's serious, it's real, it's on a scale that is unprecedented, and Australians' families deserve better. Senator Green. <clears throat> You, Deputy President, what um, this government takes incredibly seriously is the cost of living um, crisis that Australians are facing. And we certainly know that um, there are incredible pressures on um, people around the kitchen table, and that is why we are taking action at the Cabinet table. But I want to make this clear that um, what I think Australians are, um, uh, take most seriously is being left Australian taxpayers being left with trillions of dollars of debt and without any economic dividend to show for it. Because that's what the former government left behind for Australian taxpayers, not, for, not just for our government to deal with and to manage, but Australian taxpayers were left with a trillion dollars of debt and nothing to show for it from the Liberal Party. They were left with a budget mess. They were left with a decade of no energy policy to actually deal with uh, cost of power prices or um, in increasing renewable energy. Uh, they were left with a government that was more interested in pork barrelling than they were to um, actually investing in our economy and fixing the care economy, providing opportunities for women to get involved in the economy and making sure that people could have real wage rises. We never saw that under 10 years of the former government. And that's why when we sit on this side of the chamber, we take these issues incredibly seriously. But it's hard to take the objections of those opposite seriously when they pretend now to care about real rages, that they care now to, to care about power prices um, and to take the Liberal National Party seriously when they start to care about budget management, when they um, left Australian taxpayers with a trillion dollars of debt, but were happy to go and spend that money, like Liberal national money, uh, using colour-coded spreadsheets. Um, that is what we are hearing from those opposite today. What does make me smile, Senator Smith, and what makes me happy is that we finally have a government that's getting on with the hard work, the hard work of addressing these issues. We know that since the Labor government um, uh, started, we've managed to successfully argue for a wage rise for minimum wage workers, something that people had been waiting for for many, many years. Um, we've delivered uh, legislation to drive investment into cleaner and cheaper energy to put downward pressure on power prices. Finally, after 10 years to have a policy in place, they had 22 policies. They couldn't land a single one because they're so divided on climate change. They don't think it's real. So that's why they never landed a policy. So we finally have a policy that we're implementing and we're delivering um, to put downward pressure on power prices. We actually built, brought a bill into the parliament in the last, um, uh, last year. Um, we, we called um, parliament back. We got everyone back to Canberra to um, put through energy price relief because we, we could see this coming down the line. We wanted to put a cap on gas prices. And we brought that legislation to the parliament. It should have been a unifying moment for the parliament. But instead, those opposite voted against, against bill, en energy bill relief. They, they voted against giving Australian families um, a bill relief on their energy power prices. But this government is delivering cheaper childcare, and that's about to start in 100 days. And I know, I know that it's really hard for those opposite to understand that childcare is an economic issue, that it's something that will deliver an economic benefit to our country to have cheaper childcare, to have women who are not choosing between a day's work or putting their child in childcare, to have that bill reduce over um, a certain amount of time is incredibly important. That's why we prioritise cheaper childcare. 
We're delivering cheaper medicines, delivering fee-free TAFE for more universities. We're actually expanding paid parental leave to make it easier for families. And we're delivering the Housing Australia Plan to have cheaper and more affordable homes, more funding, for <clears throat> more funding to have cheaper houses, but also to make sure that we have housing for people leaving domestic violence situations. Our government is getting on <coughs> with the job with the job of reducing the cost of living pressures that Australians find themselves under. And it's no thanks to 10 years of complete disunity, disarray, denialism from over there on that side of the chamber. I'm incredibly proud of the work that we're doing and our Prime Minister uh, for the work that he is doing. We've got a long way to go and we're not afraid of the hard work, but it's no thanks to those on that side of the chamber. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. And let's just start off with the uh, childcare smear that we had there from the other side. As a stay-at-home parent, I'm very passionate about childcare, and that's why I want childcare to be optional and not make it compulsory that you only get childcare if you put your child in a childcare centre. I say let's pay the childcare payment to the actual parents, to the parents, and let the parents decide how they spend childcare. Because, for example, nurses and police and all those people that work uh, shift work, they can't pick their child up at six o'clock at night. There's other people who work part time. They may only want to uh, use childcare three or four hours a day and not have to go driving 40 minutes to a childcare centre. Let's take all those parents out in regional Queensland that have to drive 40 or 50 minutes off the farm. So I don't want to hear from Labor who only use childcare as a means to uh, pay the childcare centres so they can clip the ticket on union fees. No, 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 no. Our children are much more important than that. They are not a means by which you collect uh, union fees. Thanks very much. And then let's go to this whole issue of a trillion dollars debt. We actually had $800 billion in debt. And can I say that we were tracking very well, and I know my first year here as a senator, we actually had less than a billion dollars, uh, sorry, less than a million dollars in deficit. And we were, had the debt uh, back down to 500 uh, billion after Kevin Rudd's crazy, uh, Kevin Rudd and Julie uh, Gillard's uh, crazy expenditure. But unfortunately, we had state uh, Labor premiers uh, create a wall of hysteria. You know, it was like a raging bushfire that they just couldn't control day in, day out. COVID press conferences, one at nine, one at 10, one at 11, one at 12, scaring everyone about COVID, wanting more and more money. Uh, and we still haven't got an audit yet on all that money paid by the federal government to the state government as to uh, four cases, COVID cases in hospital. And if you go and look at the New South Wales health data last year, they have more deaths from COVID than what the ABS recorded nationally. So you've got to ask yourself what type of bookkeeping went on with this COVID hysteria and was it just the means by these autocratic health state health bureaucrats who were actually locking people down and collecting the money uh, in their back pockets, not to mention the billions of dollars on vaccines that you know the, the premiers uh, all mandated on people, and that they were going to be basically either you've got to take this vaccine that costs a lot of money that we're going to pay a faulty, foreign multinational for, uh, and it didn't even stop transmission or infection. And we found out just this week from Atagi that there's actually greater risk of myocarditis for young people under 30 uh, from the vaccine than from the virus. From the virus. I mean, this was what you know. I stood up for, and no one listened. So not only did we not get bang for buck, these people over here, the other side, Labor, have have a gall, have the gall to accuse us of racking up debt when they were fueling the fire day in, day out, with daily press conferences. But let's focus on the cost of living, shall we, this week? Because heavens knows, all we've been doing this week is talking about identity politics yet again. This is the great distraction on this side of the chamber. These people are only ever interested in command and control, and they do that by dividing the people based on identity politics. And we've had enough of that. And we heard that here today in the chamber, where we're talking about cost of living, and suddenly we pivot to identity politics. And you know why they pivot to identity politics? Because they have no idea how to manage an economy. They have no idea how to manage their economy. I know in my home state of Queensland, the Bly Beatty government sold all of our infrastructure. I'll tell you where you control costs. If you want to control costs, you build infrastructure. You build power stations, power stations that provide cheap, reliable energy that drive down the cost of electricity. That's how you do it. You build dams. 
to provide irrigation, to, to, uh, to you know, irrigate more, more farmland so you can have cheaper food. You build better roads and you basically do it through good economic management and sound monetary policy. And we know that the other side of the chamber over there, you know, they're, they're not focused on the things that matter. They aren't focused on people. That is who put us here, the people. They are focused on empowering their bureaucrats, their fund managers in superannuation, their corporate executives. I mean, they've taken over the big end of town on that front as well now through superannuation. And if they were really worried about the cost of living, they would make superannuation optional. Let the workers, let those people, it's their money, let them keep their wages, let them pay off their mortgages. Imagine if we could uh, give access to the workers and uh, they could access their super and pay down their mortgages and not have to pay these high interest rates. That's the way you deal with cost of living. I put the question. Those for the question say aye against. No. The ayes have it. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. I rise to take note to Minister Watt's response to my question about gambling harm. And frankly, Minister Watt's answers were pathetic, totally pathetic. We have got so much harm from gambling that is being experienced by people in this country. They're, the losses of gambling are the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare estimates that Australians lost approximately $25 billion on legal forms of gambling in 2018-19, the largest per capita losses in the world. We, the Australian Communications and Media Authority said that 11 per cent of Australians gamble online. In my home municipality of Maribyrnong, I know that the average losses per adult are $1,000 a year. And most of the adults I know don't gamble at all. So it means that the gambling losses of the people who can least afford to lose money are massive. There is such huge damage and harm being done to people in Australia today by gambling. My question to Minister Watt went to three very straight forward actions that governments can take to limit the harm of, of gambling. One is to ban gambling advertising. Seventy per cent of Australians want to see gambling advertised banned. They want it to be banned everywhere and all the time. Mm -hmm. And yet, in response to my answer about will the government ban gambling advertising, Minister Watt said that we have to make sure that gambling promotions were being presented in a responsible manner. Now, come on, that just does not cut it. We know that the damage that is done by gambling advertising is very similar to the damage that was done by tobacco advertising decades ago. And finally, governments were moved to ban tobacco advertising. We need to have a strong commitment to ban gambling advertising now. The second area that I um, put forward as being necessary to be limiting the harm from gambling was to ban donations from gambling companies, because we know the insidious harm and the influence that those gambling donations have. And we have got the stark evidence of the Minister for Communications, the minister who manages online gambling, accepting almost $20,000 in donations to her own election campaign before the last election. This is outrageous and absolutely shows the influence of the gambling companies on this government. And yet, in response to will the government consider banning donations, the minister went off on some complete deflection trying to equate the fact that the Greens received donations from somebody who made money out of beating the house at gambling to their receiving of donations from gambling companies. It's like trying to equate getting a donation from a smoker from donations from the tobacco industry. It's a complete irrelevancy and it just shows the lack of focus and the lack of commitment by this government to be reducing the influence of the gambling companies. And we know the insidious influence they have. Mm -hmm. The third area that I felt that I proposed to the government that we need to have action was to introduce a national gambling regulator, to be regulating the online gambling that is showing that is doing so much harm. Because online gambling it occurs nationally, it occurs internationally. We need to have national regulation to reduce the harm from on online gambling. Instead, 
what we got a commitment to was we've got another inquiry. If you don't want to do anything, we're going to look into it. We're going to have another inquiry. You talk to any advocate, anybody who knows about the harm of being caused by gambling, we do not need another inquiry. We need a national gambling regulator to regulate gambling in this country. There is a need for action on gambling at all levels of government, at local government, at state government and at federal government. At the state government level, there are state governments right across the country that are taking action, which is why in New South Wales you have got the opportunity, if you live in New South Wales, to be voting for the Greens on Saturday, who have got an election platform yeah. that would really tackle gambling issues, where they want to be phasing out pokey machines, introducing a cashless gambling card, introducing a pokey super profit tax and banning political donations from gambling. These are the sort of measures that need to happen. These are the sort of measures that Greens in state and federal and local government are willing to take action on, and they're the sort of measures that this government really need to take seriously. I'll put the question, those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it.